Hello, my name is Kathleen Zellman. I'm a registered dietitian and a nutrition communications consultant, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. We want to discuss ways we can address hunger, overcome challenges we face in feeding a growing global population, and GMOs. We live in a land of abundance, but we also have food deserts and hunger right here in the United States. And here in the Southeast, the impact of hunger is real. Biotechnology and crop engineering is a tool that can help. Our objectives today, first, to foster understanding of food, nutrition, and agriculture. Secondly, we want to address the controversial issues surrounding genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, also known as genetic engineering. Third, we want to try to build trust and further understanding of the science and the evidence behind GMOs and how it has the potential to meet growing food demands globally and to help solve hunger problems worldwide. Our first guest to my left is Dr. Allison Van Enenam, PhD from the University of California at Davis, where she also earned her MS and her PhD in animal science and genetics. She is the recipient of the 2014 Borlaug Communication Award for her international efforts to help professionals and consumers understand the science of biotechnology. Our next guest is Dr. Natalie Di Nicola, PhD, president of the consulting firm Di Nicola LLC. Natalie has over 20 years of experience in the agri-food industry and a decade of experience in sustainability and agricultural development. Her expertise focuses on food and agriculture, policy, food and nutrition security, hunger, malnutrition, and sustainability. And our final guest today is H. Barlow, a second generation dairy farmer from Cave City, Kentucky. H. grew up on a dairy farm and paid his way through college milking cows at the University of Kentucky's research farm. Now he operates a 193-acre dairy farm with 250 cows, and he also has row crops like corns and soybeans that he feeds to his dairy cows. He has been using GMO varieties since they were introduced and has witnessed firsthand the benefits with his animals, the crop yields, and also with the sustainability of his land. Thank you all for being with us today in this important discussion. Before we dive into the questions with our panelists, allow me to provide some general background about what we'll be discussing today. These are facts, they're not opinions. Genetic engineering is an application of biotechnology and it's the process of manually adding new DNA to an organism. It is a very precise approach to add a desired characteristic. The goal is to either add or delete one or more new traits that are not already found in the organism, and the intent is to give it a desirable attribute. Examples of genetically engineered organisms, or GMOs, that are currently on the market include plants with resistance to some insects, plants that can tolerate herbicides, improved drought tolerance, disease resistance, and enhanced nutritional profile of foods like golden rice. Currently, there are 10 approved genetically engineered crops, soybean, maize or corn, cotton, sugar beet, canola, papaya, squash, and alfalfa. Potato and apple have recently been uh, approved, but yet they're not in wide use yet. It takes roughly 10 to 12 years to gain approval and bring a new crop to market. Regulatory oversight of genetically engineered crops is overseen by the EPA, the USDA, and the FDA. And it's estimated that 70 to 80 percent of processed foods contain GMO ingredients and have been used in foods for almost 20 years. Now, when it comes to hunger, crops produced using genetic engineering could play a very important role in helping to address this issue and the challenge of feeding a growing population around the world. We could improve the global standard of living today and for future generations. But is it safe? According to a recent meta-analysis from Italy that looked at 1,783 records on GE crop safety worldwide over the past decade, they concluded, and I quote, the scientific research conducted so far has not detected any significant hazards directly connected with the use of GE crops. And I think it's noteworthy that the National Academy of Science, the World Health Organization, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, 
the European Food Safety Authority, and Food Standards Australia New Zealand, the American Medical Association, the Center for Science and the Public Interest are just a few of the international organizations that support and have position papers on the use of GE as it applies to food. This breeding method offers one approach to help enhance food security and human well-being, and it also enables farmers to produce food more sustainably. Despite this potential and the benefits that have been derived by the 18 million farmers that currently grow GMO crops globally, it remains an area of great concern, emotion, conflict, and misunderstanding for consumers. We live in a world where it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between fact and fiction. Today we're going to address some of the common consumer concerns with our distinguished group of experts. So let's dig right in. The first thing I want to go to, and Natalie, Natalie, I hope that you'll start with me, is what about the basics? What is biotechnology and how is it different from traditional breeding? And can you give us some examples that help us better understand what is a GMO? What we're really discussing here are some of the tools that are intended to try to help improve the genetics of the seed that the farmer is using. Um, I think it's important to realize that genes move between plants all the time in nature. But thousands of years ago, mankind realized that we could use breeding to select certain parent plants and combine them to create an offspring that's going to express certain kind of characteristics that we thought were useful and desirable. Um, genetic engineering, which creates genetically modified organisms, or GMOs as they've been termed, is essentially a form of plant breeding that's more precise where you, under, you understand the gene or the, the few genes that, you're, that are responsible for a certain desirable trait, and you put that into the plant that you want, with the background that you want, in a very precise way. Um, and I think that context is very important for this conversation, because you hear statistics that we have 7 billion people today, it's going to move to 9 billion. We have a real window of time in the next 40 years where we're going to need to produce more food than we have in the history of mankind accumulated. And we're going to need to do this in, in the um, face of a changing climate, which not only means that sometimes the conditions are much more harsh in terms of heat and water stress, but also that plant pest pressures change. And where you can grow certain kinds of plants changes. So these are the, these are the big challenges we're trying to solve and these kind of tools, whether these genetic type tools or some of these production practices tools, are really help farm, helping farmers have choices to try to address those challenges. Because at the end of the day, it's really falling on the shoulders of the farmers as land managers to try to meet these, meet these challenges for all of us. Thank you, Natalie. I, you know, I'd like to delve in here a little bit. You know, I've been farming <laughs> for uh, 40 years and uh, probably a little longer than that even. Of course, born and raised on a farm. And, you know, I think about what she's talking about and relate it to real world, real, my real life experience along with my fellow farmers, you know, as I look back on what we've experienced in the last 40 years. Before I went to college, I remember using a two-row corn planter. Today I use a 12-row corn planter or a 16-row corn planter. But let's talk about the yields and what it's done. I grew up on a farm, basically, it's a little larger than it was when I was a boy. But, you know, we milked like 30 cows and we took pretty much took all of that land to produce the food basically for those 30 cows and, and you know a group of heifers. Today basically that same land with the advance in technology and the scientific advantages we have today have allowed me to make that herd 250 head. And I think that's majorly significant. I used to shoot for a you know a hundred bushel yield in corn. That was our, that was always the, our bellwether target. And today 200 bushels is our target. The breeding programs that she's talking about in the plant world have been fantastic for us farmers. And, you know, when you stop and think about how few of us there are today, you know, less than 2% of the American population are farmers. And we couldn't have done that without the latest and the greatest science and technology advances that we've done. And I guess I, I would just like to, to say genetic engineering is a breeding method. It can be used for many different things. It's used to solve problems, mm -hmm. problems of agriculture, be they insects, be they disease. There's a disease resistant um, 
papaya that's been developed. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it moves useful genetic variation from one species to another. In the case of papaya, it brings in the genetic variation that enables those papaya to de be disease resistant and effectively saved the Hawaiian papaya industry. It was wiped um, out, wasn't it? It, it was. Yes. And so to me, it's, it's a problem solving breeding tool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what genetic engineering is and what differentiates it from the conventional breeding that's been such an important part of agriculture is the ability to bring in useful genetic variation, potentially from another species that you don't have, that you don't have access to in conventional breeding programs from within species. Well, that brings us to our next topic. Is it safe? And um, Alison, you've done a wealth of research, um, which has been publicly funded. So tell us about the safety and the safety records and the evidence that supports the safety of the food. The gap between what the, the scientists think about the safety of this food, around about 90% of the scientists think it's a safe technology, versus 36% of consumers. So there's more than a 50% gap between what the science says and what consumers believe. And it is a scary sounding technology and there's a lot of information out there on the internet, particularly targeting um, parents and, and and, and young mm -hmm. children pictures and of you know as a parent myself I you know I, I the safety of our food supply is, is a very important issue to me and I, I I get very frustrated when information's put out there that suggests mm -hmm. that this is in fact not a safe um, technology when the evidence says exactly the opposite. And so I guess when I look at um, the safety data, I look at the literally thousands of studies that have been done um, by both public sector scientists and the private companies, um, and they've all come to the same conclusion, and that is that this breeding method, which basically brings in DNA and protein, is at producing food that doesn't have any unique risks associated with it. And, you know, if you think as a nutritionist and a dietitian, we eat DNA all the time. Right. I had a banana for breakfast. Mm -hmm. I ate DNA from bananas and banana proteins. Mm -hmm. They get digested in your stomach. Um, and so if the protein itself is shown to be safe, and, and in the case of all the approved events, that's been the case, and it doesn't introduce new allergens, and that's checked for before these products go to market, there's no biological hypothesis why this would be unsafe food. It's just food at mm -hmm. this stage. And so every major scientific society in the world has come to the conclusion that there's no unique safety risks. All of the marketed genetically engineered crops or GMOs on the market today have been through the FDA safety evaluation. At the end of the day, I have to let that determine my attitude to the safety of this food. And um, I think that the science in that regard is, is very, very solid and very voluminous. <laughs> well, that's even better. And I mean, the food has been around, the GMO foods have been around for at least 20 years. And it's estimated that 70 to 80 percent of the processed foods that we purchase contain some GMO ingredients. So we have 20 years of mm -hmm. consumption and a wealth of data. And as a registered dietitian um, and member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, we rely on scientific evidence. So that's what we have to rely on. But yet this, this, issue seems to have been sidestepped and I think maybe the internet certainly hasn't helped and social media and the emotions that are surrounding it. Well, you know, and I think unfortunately fear sells yeah. and a lot of the internet information you see is particularly targeting pregnant women and mm -hmm. people with young nursing babies and I, as, a, as a mother I find it very disingenuous to try to scare people about a technology that has this documented safety record um, when there is that's not what the, you know the data says and I, I find it very manipulative to try to target um, people like that and, and I think it's distressing when you have people that are worried about that when there are are real food safety risks. Let's worry about the real food risks and not spend our time worrying about hypothetical risks that have never been documented to occur in over 20 years of consuming these products. Yes. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I would plant corn and, um, you know, we used an insecticide with the seed to prevent, you know, corn borer damage. That was a major insect in Today, that's been bred into the plant that we don't use that insecticide anymore. I use practically just a, just a fraction of the insecticides I used to use on my crops today that I did before. And most of that is because of the excellent, you know, advances that they've done in the breeding programs in the, in the plants to breed that gene in there to where it stops that, 
you know, that insect from eating it. And, and that's allowed us to also, you know, to get us more yield and everything. You know, talking about sustainability of, you know, we do know that we want to protect our forest. We want to protect, you know, we don't want any more land going into production than we have to. Erosion used to be a real buzzword in the, in the you know, agricultural industry. Because of the technology that has been given to us, you know, basically no-till farming became something that has allowed us to grow our industry and use this, you know, without all of this tillage. And that was basically brought on because of our GMO foods. We don't have to cultivate to get rid of our weeds. We can spray over the top. After we, plant our, after we plant our crops, we can spur over the top and kill any weeds that may have come up. And that's a fantastic advancement over going in there and plowing through the field to make sure we're trying to kill the weeds by conventional tillage and all of those things. And if you do that from an organic side, I think their production level will be greatly reduced compared to using GMO crops. Mm -hmm. So why you brought up pesticides and insecticides is a type of a pesticide. Um, it's estimated that from 1996 to 2011 that biotech crops have collectively reduced global pesticide applications by one billion pounds. That's, that's a significant benefit to the environment. Absolutely. Um, and then roughly 45% reduction of insecticides since the use of Bt corn. So clearly GMO seeds are helping the environment. Absolutely. Helping us to use less pesticides, insecticides, whatever type of pesticides. Um, but do all GMO crops um, involve the use of pesticides? No. <laughs> no, no, they don't all. So it's a breeding method that yeah. can be used for many purposes. Right. It's another tool in the toolbox, The disease-resistant right? papaya yes. does not involve the use of any type of pesticides. And I think it's really important, and you made a, a very a good statement, that pesticides is a general expression right. about controlling pests. And all agricultural systems have to do control pests. And those pests may be weeds, they may be insects, they may be diseases. and to the point that this is trying to solve problems, you can use genetic engineering to address different pests, be they disease, be they insect protected crops like the Bt, which as you said has had a dramatic decrease in the use of insecticides globally, a 45% decrease. I mean that's that's an amazing uh, thing. And then finally there's the weed issue and, and I think that it's, it's great to have a farmer here to hear how it works in the field but um, there are of course the, the weed uh, tolerant crops or excuse me the herbicide tolerant crops or the Roundup Ready crops or glyphosate tolerant crops. And I think what's really important there is that that actually enabled uh, the adoption of the no-till technology that H was referring to, but it also enabled the uh, substitution of a, of a much safer herbicide than what was used before these crops were introduced in 1997. And I think when we talk about agriculture, we have to talk about the trade-offs that are associated with these production systems. And it's very frustrating as an ag scientist to have these kind of black and white conversations where this is good and this is bad. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's we have to have a discussion about the fact that all production systems, organic, conventional, biotech, they all have their pros and cons and their places where they work. And um, let's not have this black and white discussion because there's, there's pros and cons to all production systems. Are you concerned as a farmer, H, about resistant weeds? That um, weeds that are not being, that are uh, adapting to these um, these plants and to these um, insecticide applications? You know, it's not on top of my radar yeah. as being the thing I'm most concerned about. But it is a, you know, it is a concern. And, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. You know, I have to say I really trust our agriculture scientists mm -hmm. and our people that are in, the, in, in this field of endeavor that they will, you know, be able to come up with new chemicals, new problems, new crops, new weeds, not just chemicals, new seeds that we can use new products to control any resistant weeds. 
And I guess like this idea of pest resistance or resistance yes. developing, right. it's true for all pest control mechanisms. So there's this, there's always an evolutionary kind of a battle going on between the pests, be they insect or disease, where they're trying to evolve around kind of protection mechanisms that, are, that farmers are, are doing to protect the crop so that humans can eat it, right? That's mm -hmm. really what a farmer's job is, is to be the steward of that crop to get the product to, to, the, to the humans. And I think that's the resistance is true for many different things like the flu vaccine sure. we take each Antibiotics, year. Antibiotics, right? Well, that flu vaccine gets updated every year mm -hmm. because there's new varieties of, of flu virus that's, that's evolved resistance around the vaccines. And I haven't heard someone say, well, therefore we should stop vaccinating because it might develop resistance, what we've done is use science to try to develop and kind of uh, keep innovating our way to try to keep controls of pests. Natalie, there's been a lot of coverage about the herbicide glyphosate and its potential as a cancer-causing agent. Um, how can you enlighten us to feel more comfortable about it? Do you agree with the science there? Yeah, so um, glyphosate is a herbicide that targets an enzyme that's found in plants. The enzyme's not found in people or animals or in insects. And um, it binds strongly to soil, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, leaching into groundwater and some of the other kind of challenges you sometimes hear about. Um, so it's really seen as a very um, benign herbicide in many ways, and it's been used by farmers for a long time, well before the advent of Roundup Ready crops, um, and really helps them control hundreds of weeds on their farm. It's been in use for quite some time, and there's been a lot of toxicological data that's been gathered around it. That includes some cell assays, animal assays, um, epidemiological studies for about 40 years now, where we have a strong database of information about, about glyphosate. Different regulatory agencies have looked at the body of evidence around the toxicology of glyphosate, as well as the exposure levels, and concluded that it does not pose a carcinogenic risk to humans. What's happened more recently is that the International Agency for Research on Cancer has looked at the hazard of some different compounds, including glyphosate, and they determined that it did, um, in their assessment, pose a p potential human carcinogenic risk. And as you can imagine, this gained a lot of mm -hmm. concern amongst headlines. Um, but again, this is looking at the theoretical potential for hazard. It's not the whole the risk of the of the product. And if you look at other compounds that are in that category, according to IARC's um, assessment. Coffee is in that category. Um, aloe vera is in that category. Cell phones are in that category. So I think it's really important to realize what that classification actually means. Um, so I think it's important when we're thinking about risk and relative risk that we're looking at hazard and exposure um, and also thinking about um, the farmers that are using it and what it means in terms of what they're able to replace by using a herbicide like glyphosate compared to some of the other herbicides that they've been using in the past. I would hate to face next year without Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready alfalfa, and Roundup Ready soybeans. And you're and willing to feed it? that's from personal experience. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, to your grandchildren, absolutely. and you have no concerns. I mean, you know, I, no concerns whatsoever. And you know, I, I could talk about my grandchildren the rest of the day, <laughs> but uh, you know, they're healthy. And I think about what, what it's done for us is I live in Kentucky. Average rainfall in Kentucky is between 45 and 50 inches a year. I'm producing 200 bushels of corn per acre off of 45 to 50 inches when I used to get 100. And part of that is because of weed suppression because mm -hmm. of, you know, of the Roundup. And those are, we're be being able to, I think water is a big issue. We've been able to, because of the plant breeding, we've got breeders I know who are breeding drought resistant, you know, varieties of corn in these crops that still get the yield, but take a minimum amount of water. And I think that's, you know, so important. I, I just want to go overseas and stuff, you know, water is a critical issue. And we've got to have the ability to use these best and latest, greatest plant varieties to be able to harvest small amounts of water to still produce the food. Mm -hmm. 
So, Allison, I'd like to um, shift gears off of pesticides and talk about <laughs> tampering with Mother Nature. Um, some people have a real problem with the fact that we're moving genes around, and, and especially from different species. That and, and there's even things that I read that when a protein comes from a fish and it's put into a tomato, that they expect that the tomato will now taste like fish. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just clearly not a good understanding. But um, are there inherent dangers in genetic altering foods that we um, we should be aware of, unintended consequences of what could happen because of this um, in the laboratory as opposed to um, in Mother Nature's natural path? <laughs> And that assumes all things Mother Nature does are benign, and <laughs> I'm not sure about botulism toxin, yeah, although right. it does have its uses. <laughs> sure. um, Skin but cancer. <laughs> I think if you look at, you know, if I look at a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, um, I would not argue that they would occur naturally in Mother Nature either. Mm -hmm. uh, they were derived from their common ancestor, the wolf, through conventional breeding. And I think if you look at some of the, the changes we've made with conventional breeding, those, those, all of the bred plants and animals we have today wouldn't have occurred without man-made intervention. And so I think that kind of naturalistic fallacy is, doesn't really apply to our current breeding methods either. Um, but this, this thought that somehow what we're doing is, is unnatural natural and, and a fish gene and a tomato is, is it, it certainly I think touches on some of the ethical kind of issues that this this raises but as a geneticist I look at all of the genes we have in common with a with a grapefruit um, at, as a result of the fact that we all derive from a common evolutionary ancestor and there are a lot of genes that we share um, with species that are not human um, and and um, we see a lot of genetic rearrangement that occurs in nature all the time and really that genetic variation Variation is the source of evolution and mm -hmm. breeding. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's where that came from. And so I don't think that anything that this particular breeding method is doing is that dissimilar to what's happened in evolutionary history. And I guess what I see the potential of this technology is to bring in this unique genetic variation that we can't access in our breeding programs to solve problems. And that I think is where you see the passion of scientists around this technology is they see how you could address things like drought resistance or vitamin fortified, nutrient fortified crops in a way that you couldn't do accessing the, the genetic variation that exists within the species. And it can be used to solve problems such as malnutrition or drought tolerance or particularly disease resistance. But um, you mentioned this earlier about the allergens. It's a big concern because people are, are seeing that there are more and more children being diagnosed with allergies than before and what's causing it. And, and sometimes the fingers being pointed at GMOs. It's very easy to let correlation infer causation. In mm -hmm. other words, something's going up and something else is going up, so one must cause the other. Sure. And that's not necessarily a cause and effect relationship. Um, and so I know that there's, for example, there's a lot of people that have uh, got gluten sensitivity mm -hmm. now, and, and um, I've seen on the internet, you know, oh, well, the GMOs are causing that to happen. And in fact, there is no genetically engineered wheat on the right. market, and so there's this kind of, that right there is a flat out fallacy. Sure. Um, but there is increasing levels of allergens. And, and so, of course, when you bring a product to market, um, the if it does express a protein, that protein is, is checked for allergenicity, whether it's something that's a common allergen or not before it's, it's allowed or approved through, through the FDA. But I think there's some other interesting um, observations around allergens that have to do with uh, things like that the hygiene hypothesis, which you might be familiar with, mm -hmm. that suggests that, um, the, that we're uh, keeping our kids in such a state of, of hygienic uh, purity in terms of washing their mm -hmm. hands with antibiotic soap and stuff, um, that that's actually causing an increased level of allergens. Um, how can biotechnology use, be used to improve our supply, improve our nutrition, and help us feed this population that's going to be mm -hmm. um, larger than we can even estimate at this point? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really important to understand these are really complex challenges. There isn't any one kind of solution. Um, but again, it comes back to a host of different kinds of tools. So if we think about hunger around the world and malnutrition, undernutrition is really the number one health risk worldwide. It contributes to one in three child deaths. Um, there's 800 million people hungry. There's two billion who suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. 27% um, of children under five are stunted around the world. Mm -hmm. So these are really, really um, 
daunting challenges and, and they're very complex kind of problems to try to solve. One thing that I think is very interesting is that a high majority of those, or a high proportion of those that are hungry are actually farmers in a lot of these countries mm -hmm. who aren't able to produce the food they need for themselves and their family and their community in a consistent way. And that to me is a real irony. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of focus right now on trying to help address availability of food, which is a piece of it, as well as access to food and different uses of food. You know, so it's not just about there being enough food. It's also, is there food in the right places? Do people have access to it? Do they know how to use it? You know, it's a complex problem. But this availability piece is a part of it. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you think about farmers in those parts of the world being able to grow food for themselves and their families. And um, for many of them, I think you mentioned your corn yields are about 100 and. 40, 50 bushels per acre probably on average. In Africa, 300 million Africans are dependent on corn or maize for their main staple crop. And their, their average is more like around 20 bushels per acre. And it's not because those women aren't working really hard. It's because they were lacking a lot of the different kinds of tools. And they sort of stay in this trapped kind of, um, in this sort of poverty cycle. So one of the things that we can try to do is provide different kinds of tools that are gonna help them increase their harvest so that they can feed their family and ideally even have some income that they can then sell. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be achieved through lots of different tools that farmers use, but one of them is genetic engineering or GMO type uh, products. People often think of GMOs as primarily helping large farmers in the United States, but really the vast majority of farmers using this technology are actually smallholder farmers in developing countries that have five hectares or less of land that they're trying to live off of. And then there's um, the benefits in terms of improving the crop itself and its nutritive, nutritive values. So one would be, one example might be cow pea or black eyed pea that we call it here in the United States. Um, that's a major source of protein and other micronutrients in parts of Western Africa as an example. And the losses to insects are about 80%. If, if you can use the insect protection gene that H has been using on his farm in this cowpea plant. Now they have this built-in insect resistance that's really going to help them in terms of the availability of protein for their families. And then there's the whole area of biofortification. You mentioned mm -hmm. golden rice, where we're really trying to use genetic engineering to increase the availability of nutrients within some of these staple crops. To me, helping equip farmers and giving them choices wherever they are so they have different kinds of tools to meet their needs is really important, really important for all of us. Well, and the choices, obviously, if you're a farmer in a third world country, you, you want these GMO seeds because they are designed to help you increase your yield in drought conditions. <clears throat> well, we haven't got into the economic issues at all about this situation, but <clears throat> uh, my input cost have gone up tremendously in my 40 years of farming. If I, if I don't, if I'm not allowed to increase yields and breed better cows, when I got out of college, my average production was four gallons a day. Today, it's seven gallons a day with the same resources. If I'm not allowed to do those things, then I'm gonna say farms were gonna disappear. And I'm not, I'm not sure that, you know, if, if, if we converted all of the food production in this country to organic production, I think we would face mass hunger. And I'm not totally. saying that as a fear monger mm -hmm. or anything. The hypocrisy of the people that are putting out this fear drives me crazy, particularly back to her issue with the foreign people that are, that are hungry. I mean, I saw hungry people in Bolivia, South America, and Kenya, Africa, you know, that would have just loved to have some extra food. Because of my dairy background, I was allowed to, and, and asked to, not just allowed, but was asked for, to visit many dairy farms in Kenya. The average production of a Kenyan cow is between a half and one gallon of milk a day. Mm. You know why that is? That cow doesn't have anything to eat. They tried to introduce some new genetics to improve it, but if the cow doesn't have anything to eat, she can't use those good genetics to produce product. So I think big agriculture is somewhat getting a bad name. Without big agriculture, we are not gonna feed the United States, first of all. And we're definitely not gonna help our brethren across the, across the waters that 
are really hungry. And back to one thing on food security, I think a hungry person is a dangerous person. Mm. If we want peace in the world, then we've got to make sure we've got food in the world. Mm. And I believe that with all my heart. And I think we as farmers, you know, I love doing what I do. I love being a farmer. I love producing food. My son has traveled a lot in the world and says, Dad, if you're not anything else, you're a producer. You're not a consumer. You're a producer. You're producing something. You have something to be proud of. And I'm thankful for that. I don't want to take that, you know, be arrogant about it. But these things that we're talking about today have really permitted me to be a, to be a good producer, to be, a, you know, an advanced producer. And, and I would like for the American public and, and our critics to understand that we're talking about producing food, which is the most essential element of life. Well, 18 million farmers around the world are using GMO seeds, so they obviously agree with you, and it certainly is making a difference. Um, let's shift gears and, and let's talk about the animals um, in your area, Allison. Um, do I have any concern about drinking the milk from a cow that's been fed um, a GMO diet, a diet that includes GMO ingredients? That's a really good question because they have been consuming almost primarily a genetically modified feed diet for almost 20 years now. And we haven't seen any um, trends that suggest that these animals are, are unhealthy in any way as a result of consuming this this diet and that would go along with the fact that we've got the thousands of safety studies and the fact that this is DNA and protein and as dietitians and nutritionists mm -hmm. we know what we do with that in the stomach we digest it mm -hmm. um, and so to your question on milk and meat and eggs from animals that have consumed GMO foods like us animals digest their feed in their in their stomachs and there is no remnant of some uh, anything in the milk meat and eggs and so it's absolutely compositionally identical the milk from a cow that's not eaten genetically engineered feed and a cow that has eaten genetically engineered feed there's nothing <coughs> to detect there that's not what this is it's a breeding method it's dna and protein and there's, there's no residue there but another area that gets a lot of attention is labeling should we label foods that contain um, GMO ingredients? Well, I think first of all, it's wonderful that people are interested in food okay. and that they're thinking about their food. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. The conversation is very important. Um, but it's also really important that they have accurate information that's not misleading about their food. And that's one of the challenges I think we run into here. But I think most of the debate has come around the concept of mandatory labeling. Right. And mandatory labeling is required by the government and it's really intended to demonstrate a scientifically proven uh, nutritional or safety difference in the food. Is there one? And I think Allison explained, <laughs> you know, there are lots, no, lots of studies. And, and I, think that is, I think that is why there's, there's consternation around yes. this, because you're labeling, what, what are we labeling? Right. A, a breeding method? Difference? And why does this breeding method need to be labeled and not, I don't know, radiation mutagenesis or artificial right. insemination? I mean, there's lots of breeding methods. Why this one? If there's mm -hmm. no safety risks, why would you go to the, the expense of tracking all of the food in our production systems and, and getting correct mandatory labels on there in the absence of a safety concern. Mm -hmm. If I could interject here, yesterday morning, I promise you, my cows had no concern over whether they were eating a GMO produced crop or an organic produced crop. They just wanted food in front of them so they could do what they do. And, you know, I think about it sometimes, we just get hung up on things that are not important. You can't differentiate between an organic milk at the end result. Or there's no a, residue, or, there's no traceability, you know, uh, there's no difference. So, you know, whatever we can do to improve production, I think, is the name of the game, and I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> you know, I hear people talk about, oh, let's get back to the good old days. Well, you know, I kind of personally like my cell phone. I kind of personally like my uh, tractor, you know, that has some GPS technology <laughs> on it that, you know, to this past summer, I spread, put in fertilizer on my fields at home, plugged in a a card. They had done a uh, satellite imagery of my land and certain parts of the field didn't need fertilizer, certain parts did. To me that's fantastic. You know my cows are, I think they're very happy cows. <laughs> they have a lot to eat. They're well taken care of. Uh, versus 40 years ago, I believe you would have to say they're 
a happier group of cows. And I mean, everybody's worried about happy cows, but you know, and they produce a great product. And I, I, so much of that is because, you know, we've we've got things that work for us that help us to do our job. Well, you bring up a good point with your smartphone. I think that what we've seen is that we embrace, um, as a culture, advances in technology. So we use our smartphones. We like these GPS. Drones are actually another thing that farmers are using to be able to, you know, really pinpoint and do precise agricultural. But yet, um, it's fine in medicine. Um, we embrace this technology, this in medicine, we use it in medicines. All insulin is made using um, uh, this technique, but yet when it comes to food, it's emotional. The emotions outweigh the science because you have laid out so eloquently the scientific evidence, the facts. Why is education so important and how can we make people better understand where the real science lies? What do we need to do? It's really not about the science anymore. I'll give you an answer that's just emotional because I think that's where people come at when they're looking at food and, um, you know, do I feed this to my, to my children? Absolutely mm -hmm. I do and I also vaccinate my kids and I also give them pasteurised milk because as a parent it's my job to do the best job I can to understand what the actual literature and, and science is around techniques and, and dietary choices for my family and, um, you know, I love my kids as much as the non-scientists, as shocking as that <laughs> might be. Even scientists love their kids. And, you know, this is a technology that I see that I want my kids' generation to have access to so that they can produce food in the most environmentally uh, sustainable manner possible. And if I look at the advances that animal breeding has made to the, the, um, glo the carbon footprint of a glass of milk, for example, and I think H alluded to it earlier, the, the carbon footprint of a glass of milk is about about one third what it was in the 1940s. And so I want my kids' generation to have access to agricultural technologies that will enable them to produce the food that's needed on the minimum amount of land possible with the least environmental degradation. And to me, this breeding method offers that opportunity through things like disease resistance. Um, and so that's where, as on, a, on an emotional level, I don't want to see my kids living in a generation that fears technology based on myths and misperceptions mm -hmm. rather than actually on the, di the data and the science. So Natalie, what do you think the biggest misperception is and what, what are your thoughts on how we can bridge this gap? So I think some of the challenge maybe underlying is this mistrust we have in forgetting that um, it's all about people who are doing a job to try to solve these problems. And for all of us, it's our responsibility, in my opinion, to do enough homework that we're making informed decisions on something as important as this for the future of all of us. I think that a lot of consumers look to the nutrition community for expertise around safety and health in their mm -hmm. diet. And so I think um, it's wonderful that you're trying to share with your community um, some of the different information and get answers to some of the questions they have because their voice in the debate is really very important. Thank you. I agree. This has been a fascinating and informative discussion and I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us today. This is a controversial and sometimes emotional issue for many people, so I hope we've cleared up a lot of misconceptions and provided clear explanations about the GMO process, the safety of biotech foods for animals, for humans. And while the debate is far from over, our goal is to arm people with the facts so they can make informed decisions for themselves and for their families. Thank you.